Hello. We're going to be finishing uh, most of the first chapter today. It's obvious in verse 12 that it seems that the church at Philippi had become very concerned about Paul. Maybe they hadn't heard anything but rumors. And suddenly, Paul, uh, a man comes, uh, Epaphroditus, from the church and apparently had some questions. We learn of him from chapter 2, verse 25. So Paul seems to be answering some of these concerns in verse 12. Now, I want uh, you to rest assured, brothers, that those things which have befallen me. Now, what things is he talking about? Well, I think his arrest and imprisonment, uh, his trial at Rome, those are the kind of things they're concerned about. You know, it's interesting to me that in Acts 21, 10 and following, Agabus told Paul, if you go to Jerusalem, you're going to be uh, in, imprisoned and uh, go to trial. And then back in excuse me, Acts 9, 15, God told Ananias that Paul was going to preach to the Gentiles and stand before kings for him. Now, isn't it funny how God is working all this out in the life of Paul, but it wasn't the way Paul thought it was going to happen. Isn't it unusual that God, God takes things that look so negative and uses them to his honor and glory? Friends, God does control this world. I really think uh, Isaiah 55, 9 through 11, our ways aren't God ways, but God was involved with this. And even in Paul's imprisonment, the glory and plan of God. Nothing just happens to God's children. Our lives are not controlled by chance or fate or luck or horoscopes. There is a plan. And if we'll realize that, life will be easier for us, more joyous for us, more peaceful for us, and yes, more God-honoring. Now, notice where it mentions then that they have actually in the progress of the good news. Now, the word progress is an interesting term. It's used in this chapter here and in verse 25. Also in 1 Timothy 4.15 is the only place it's used in the New Testament. It has two primary etymological backgrounds of either one of which Paul could have drawn on. Number one, it was a military term for an army advancing over a hard or tough terrain by means of advanced scouts removing some of the barriers. It was also used in the philosophical world of the Stoics to mean the difficult pass that leads to, to uh, wisdom. And so you can see that Paul's not saying it wasn't hard. Paul's not saying, oh, no problem. He's saying it is hard. I'm having a hard time. I am worried. But I know that God's with me, and there's a purpose in it. Now, what is the progress of the gospel that Paul is mentioning here, That what's happening while he's in prison? It seems to be defined in verses 13 and 14. In verse 13, it's obvious that one of the things that are happening is that the gospel is being spread in the very heart of the Roman imperial government to these elite Roman troops, to the lawyers and servants in the palace, as well as the gospel being presented uh, to the uh, emperor himself. Then in verse 14 it says, not only is gospel being spread in very high echelon of government, but the, the Christians, apparently at Rome, other Christian preachers who were somewhat reluctant to speak in Rome about Christ, had taken great courage from Paul's demeanor, attitude, and actions in prison, and they had become bold in preaching the gospel themselves. So there are two aspects that Paul mentions of how the gospel has been furthered while he's in prison. Now notice it mentions the, my translation, I use the Williams translation, uh, the imperial guard. Now, King James has palace here, and that's very possible. You can see the use of this term like that in Acts 23.35. It originally meant the headquarters of the Roman uh, provincial government authority. Originally the word meant the general's tent. But as the military aspect of Roman rule passed and the administrative aspect came, it came to be used for the place where justice was administered. However, it becomes obvious, particularly from the writings of Lightfoot, that in Paul's day, this word was used not so much for a building, but this elite Roman guard called the Imperial Guard. Now, they seem to have been started by Augustus, but they were centralized in Rome by Tiberius. They were apparently all of the same rank, centurions. They had double pay, special privileges, and they came to be such an elite group that they're really the ones that chose the new emperor.
Uh, they were very powerful until the time of Aug uh, to the time of Constantine when he disbanded this group. So the fact that Paul was permeating this group was very, very significant. The reason I think it is men and not a building is because the remainder of the verse says, and to all the rest, which seems to imply the, the legal administrators, the servants, and many other aspects of the palace life or Roman life was being affected by Paul's preaching of the gospel. Uh, that I am a prisoner in the service of Christ and that most of the Christian brothers, now in the Greek text, the word brothers is, in my translation is linked with the phrase in the Lord. But it seems a bit redundant to say brothers in the Lord for brothers implies Christians. So many translations have taken the word, little phrase in the Lord with the word confident or confidence, which means the basis for their confidence was Christ and what he was doing in Paul's life have grown confident enough because of my imprisonment to dare to tell God's message without being afraid. One thing here, Paul's witness under pressure, under trial, was very significant in the lives of others. My Christian friends, I want you to know that the way you handle pressures, the way you handle problems, the way you handle defeats, really is a witness to others. It's a witness to the lost, it's a witness to other believers. Friends, don't you know that God puts you under pressure for the purpose of glorifying Him? It is crucial that we see suffering is in the plan of God for believers. Suffering is in the plan of God for Jesus, Hebrews 5, 8. Suffering is in the plan of God for Christians, 1 Peter 4, 12 through 16. Many were being affected. It's easy to say, oh, how I love Jesus when things are going good. But when things are really going tough, that's when people really perk up their ears to the Christian witness. That's what Paul was saying here. Now the term God's message, there's a manuscript variation that I've mentioned in your notes in detail. I don't think the word God should be here because uh, there, are very, uh, uh, there are variant forms in a different manuscript and it seems to be a later edition, although it's in some very good early manuscripts we have. But the truth is, we don't have any manuscripts until the second, third, and fourth century, which is uh, hundreds of years after the death of Christ and the apostles themselves. So we have copies of copies of copies of copies. <laughs> now in verse 15, I think it's very interesting that we mentioned that most of the brothers were encouraged. Then it says some, and I think some has to relate back to verse 14. Some brothers indeed have actually preaching Christ because they are moved by jealousy and partisanship. Look down at verse 17. The farmer are preaching Christ from motives of rivalry, not sincerity. Look down at verse 18. They are, they, Christ is being preached. Now, th there's been much discussion about who are these um, preachers who are preaching from jealousy and rivalry. Lightfoot says they're Judaizers, which we find in the book of Galatians. And in chapter 3, verse 2 and following of this book, they are mentioned. And yet Paul has such harsh words for them. In Galatians, they, they're preaching a different gospel. I don't think this can be the false teachers because they surely wouldn't be preaching Christ as is expressed in verse 18. Well, who is it then? Well, it seems to be Christian preachers with bad attitudes. Not bad attitudes about Christ and the gospel, but bad attitudes about Paul and his authority and his ministry. Now, how could this be? Well, it's all supposition, but I think it's maybe uh, some evidence here. You know, Paul came to Rome later. He didn't start the church in Rome. Maybe the established leaders were jealous of Paul's popularity and insight and effectiveness in the gospel. Others have said, no, it's not that. It's those Christian preachers who were mad at either the Jews for imprisoning Paul or the Roman authorities for acting in this way, and they were showing hostility against the Jews or the authorities and thereby bringing reproach on the gospel. That's possible. I'm not sure we know who these are, but I want to say this to you. It's obvious that the problems of the first century are still in our day. Human beings haven't changed. Do you mean it's true that some preachers preach the true gospel but from bad motives? Oh, don't you know that? Don't you know that from our world? You see, the real power is not in the proclaimer, but in that which is proclaimed. This was struggled with in the church very early, particularly the Montanist controversy of the early centuries in North Africa, that the effectiveness of the sacraments did not depend on the life of the preacher. Now, I think that's true today. I've heard the gospel preached by people who I thought had pretty um, <laughs> shoddy lifestyles, or at least greed seemed to be evident in their mannerisms. The gospel is the power of God to salvation, 
And I've often heard it said, God hits a pretty good lick with a crooked stick. I think that's true here. You might want to see Galatians chapter 5, verse 26, about the rivalry and jealousy that was in the church, the churches of Galatia, and God help us, are in the churches today. Now, I want to pick up on this idea, if I could, for a minute. Um, in verse 16, that I am providentially put here to defend the good news. Now, the word providentially put here is, is a theological emphasis by Paul that nothing just happened to him. Put here is a military term. It seemed to refer to a soldier put on watch, on guard. Now, the idea about the Christian life in the metaphors of soldiering is pretty common to Paul. It's mentioned specifically in 1 Corinthians, excuse me, 2 Corinthians 2, 3, and is alluded to in Ephesians 6, 10 and following. There's another possibility here that it, it is a metaphor for being appointed to an assigned task. And that usage comes from Luke 2, 34. But what I want to say to you here is Paul understood that nothing just happened to him outside the will of God. That does not mean that Paul was not discouraged at times. If you know the life of Paul, throughout Acts, he's the only Christian preacher I know that God had to appear to several times in a vision and say, it's all right, Paul, hang in there, I'm with you. So though he knew it theologically, he still needed encouragement. But he's saying here, I know that I'm providentially put here. Now the word to defend is exactly the same word used in verse 7 of Philippians 1. It, we get the English word apology from this Greek word. It comes from the law courts and it meant a legal defense of something. He was put there to proclaim the gospel in this highest echelon of Roman administrative law. That seems to be a fulfillment of Acts 9.15 and had always been God's plan for Paul, though Paul never expected to be on trial when he presented the gospel. Now notice the thing where it says in um, verse 17, the word rivalry. This word originally meant to spin for hire, but it came to mean an aristocratic self-arrogance. Oh, I see that denominationalism today. I see that in big churches today. I see that in uh, religious leaders today. God help us, we need to watch out for that like a serpent, for it'll get us. The self-righteousness and arrogance is the unique sin of the people of God. We've got to watch out for it. The first century church had a pluralism, sometimes based on poor motives. Don't you know we have it today? God help us. Now then beginning in verse 18, what difference does it make? And Paul's, verse 18 is very important for how we handle these differences in the church. Paul said, as long as they're preaching Christ, it's okay, I'm happy. And this is not saying that theology doesn't matter. It's saying that as long as true theology about Jesus is being preached, our idiosyncrasies and differences, even our bad motives, can be overlooked in love. Now notice in verse 19, for I know that through, now two things Paul has confidence in. Number one is that their prayers and the power and provision of the Holy Spirit. Now that's very significant. Here is human agency and the gift of the Spirit, the power of the Spirit. Now how do those work together? Well, it's interesting to me as I look at the different accounts of Paul, how often he requested prayer on behalf of the Christians to which he ministered. Paul thought prayer was significant in his own life. Let me give you a few. Romans 15:30. 2 Corinthians 1, 11, Ephesians 6, 18 and 19, Colossians 4, 3, and 1 Thessalonians 5, 25. I must admit to you that intercessory prayer is something of a mystery. I don't know how God uses our concerns in the lives of others. I don't know how God uses our prayers in the furtherance of the gospel, for surely it is his desire the gospel be furthered. Let me make a theological statement. I believe that God has limited his actions to the prayers of his children. M many times we have not because we ask not. Now, I don't understand how me praying for someone else or for some, something else like the gospel releases the power of the Spirit in a unique way and an effective way. But you know from the Bible it's true. Somehow our prayers do make a difference. And that makes it very, very significant that we pray, not only for ourselves, but for others. Not only for others, but for the furtherance of the gospel in a fallen, evil world. I was in school recently with a man who is committed to praying for the downfall of Islam. I'm going to pray with him. Now, notice if you would here, 
where it mentions then your prayers and a bountiful supply. Now this we originally meant to equip a chorus, but it, it was used as kind of a metaphor for super abundance, overflowing supply. Now, the spirit of Jesus Christ. Isn't it unusual that quite often in the Bible, the spirit is spoken of in terms of Jesus? Their ministry is so interwoven. From John chapters 14 through 16, we understand the ministry of the Spirit is to bring conviction of sin, then to illumine the gospel about the person and work of Christ, to draw people to Christ, to baptize them into Christ, and then to form Christ in them. So really the whole work of the Spirit is in line with the person and work of Christ. That's very important. For quite often he's called the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of Christ Jesus, the Spirit of his Son. Note these verses, if you would, please. Romans 8, 9, 2 Corinthians 3, 18, Galatians 4, 6, and 1 Peter 1, 11, for the unique blending of the Spirit of the Son and the Spirit in our day. Now, will turn out for my spiritual welfare. Now the word spiritual welfare here is the Greek wor word salvation. Boy, that has caused a lot of different opinions here. Some say Paul's referring to spiritual salvation. That's how the word is used most often in Paul. That's how Lightfoot said it's used. And I can see that's true. For many times Paul talks about salvation both to being a past act, a present reality and progress, and a future consummation. So here it's the present and the future combined. And I think I can see that true. But it's unique that in the Greek text, the words are exactly the Greek words of the Septuagint's translation of Job 13, 16. So maybe it's in the sense of vindication. Job knew that when he ultimately stood before God, he would be vindicated. Paul says, I know that ultimately when I stand before God, I will be vindicated. That may be a very possible sense here. Others have said that the Old Testament word for salvation or deliverance speaks of physical deliverance and therefore this word may refer to Paul's a sense of being released from prison, from his Roman trial. Now that's very possible also. You might want to see the use of this word in that way in Mark 13, 11 and Luke 12, 11 and 12. This is the way the Revised Standard Version of the Bible translates it, Moffat translations, and the New American Standard Bible translates it. Now, notice where it says in verse 20, in accordance with my eager expectation. This is almost a word that was coined by Paul. It was a word that meant the outstretched neck, eagerly looking for something. Well, this is the idea of, a, of an eager anticipation. It's used only in one place else, Romans 8:19 and hope that I shall never disgrace myself, be ashamed. Now the word be ashamed here is used in the sense that I will fully fulfill God's assigned task to me, which is what? Preaching Christ before the Gentile rulers. Paul was very concerned about that. He talks about buffeting his own body so he wouldn't be disqualified from the race. He was very conscious of limiting his own freedoms and watching out for his old sin nature is obvious from Romans 7. You mean he recognized that it's possible that he might stumble even in a great and a calling and equipping by God? Yes. You see, it's all of the grace of God, but we must cooperate with the grace of God. I think we all know people who started out so well and ended up so poorly. Paul was concerned with that. He wanted to run the race to its conclusion with faithfulness, and that's the illusion, I think, here. Um, then he mentions, but now but that now as always, uh, here too, by my all-conquering courage, whether by living or dying. Now, what does he mean here? The word all-conquering courage is a Greek word that means boldness to speak. Speak before authority, speak the truth amidst persecution. It's used that way in 2 Corinthians 3.12, Ephesians 6.19, and 1 Thessalonians 2.2. 2. And I think that's the flavor of the word here. Now, in verse, uh, the latter part of verse uh, 20, it's very important. Christ will be honored in me. The word here is magnified. Beloved, it's passive, which means that Paul didn't see himself as honoring Christ, but he saw Christ honoring himself through Paul. It's very important that we realize that we are not the focus of, of spiritual power. We're merely a channel. But I also want to say this. Whether in prison, 
whether in good times or bad times, whether in effectiveness or seemingly ineffectiveness, God is going to be honored in us if we yield ourselves to him. Paul, even in prison, said, I want God to be honored in me. Friends, that's true of us, too. Our lives will honor God if we yield ourselves to him. We may not understand the circumstances. We may feel like God has uh, somehow been late on our behalf, but he hadn't. Notice in me. The word here in Greek is the word soma, or body. In 1 Corinthians 6.20, it says, glorify God in your bodies because you've been bought with a price. Friends, we're going to glorify God in our bodies or we're not going to glorify God at all. We forget that the focus of God being honored is in the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is us. And I think it's crucial that our daily lives are really where God can be seen, magnified, if you please, in our attitudes, motives, and actions. That's so important. Now, in verse 21, for me, living means Christ, and dying brings gain. Living here is in present tense, meaning continual physical life. Dying is in aorist tense, which means the act of dying. What does this mean here then? Living means Christ. I think it means that for the Christian, we have died to the law, we have died to sin, we have died to self, and now we're alive unto God's service. It's not a, a, a physical death of our personality. It's a death to human priorities. And it is a focusing on God's priorities, not our priorities. This seems to be clear to me in the use of this concept in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 11, Colossians chapter 3, verse 4, and uniquely in Galatians where Paul says he is crucified. He, he, he is crucified with Christ. He's crucified to the world, on and on. Look at Galatians 2.20. Galatians 5.34 and Galatians 6.14 where this concept of Paul's death is emphasized. Now, this idea here about dying brings gain. This doesn't mean gain to Paul that Paul will just be in heaven in fellowship with Christ. Though so that is what 23 is going to be all about. It's going to bring gain to the gospel. Paul's death will bring gain to the gospel and honor to Christ. Paul's life will bring gain to the gospel and honor to Christ. And he's caught between the two. Should I die and bring honor by my death? Or should I live and bring honor by my life? That's what the rest of this is all about. The fruit of my labor, some say, well, it means that his work already started will be consummated. Others say, no, it'll be future work. And we must admit that many, there's many good evidence that Paul was released from prison and actually went to the western Mediterranean, Spain, for the pastoral epistles, their chronology is not fit in the book of Acts. And very early, the Clement of Rome in his letter to, to, uh, to Corinth, chapter 5, uh, in Eusebius' Ecclesiastical History, chapter two, twenty-two, uh, in Chrysostom, there's an evidence that Paul was released and went on a fourth missionary journey, and I believe he did. Notice where it says, I cannot tell. This word means to declare. Paul doesn't have the choice of living or dying. He says God does, and I don't know which God would choose. Either is fine with me. Now, notice where it says, I am hesitating between two desires, crushed in between the two. That's the word here. And I long, this is the word lust, but here used in a positive sense, to depart. The word depart, it's used in 2 Corinthians 5 for the taking down of a tent. And its original etymology meant the breaking of a military camp to be moved somewhere. It also meant the loosening of a ship to go on its journey. So it's the ideal of death, to be with Christ. Now, originally, uh, Christianity with Judaism shared the idea of there be a, a resurrection on the last day. But this adds a new thought, that from the time of resurrection day, it's not a soul sleep, but we're going to have an active fellowship with God. That seems to be implied in 2 Corinthians 5, 8, Luke 23, 43, and the parable of Luke 16, 19 through 31. It seems to be a disembodied state, a limited fellowship until we have our full body. That seems to be implied in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52, and 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 17. We don't know much about this, for the Bible doesn't discuss it, but it seems to imply death will be with the Lord conscious, but not in the complete sense of having our new body until resurrection day. And then it says, and that is far better, it's a series of three comparatives, not good grammar, but great theology. And for your sakes, uh, it is very necessary for me to stay on here. And the word is in the flesh here, but it doesn't mean the negative use that Paul uses it in Romans 6 and 7, but simply stay on physically. Remaining physically alive is going to help them. Now in verse 25, he says that he knows, it, it seems to imply he's going to be released. But verses 23 seem to imply he's not sure. That's why we think that 
Philippians is separate from the other prison epistles because there's some ambiguity yet mixed with hope about his possible release. Notice the mention of the word progress here uh, in the next verse along with joy. If it's true that progress has an element of difficulty, trials, and problems, how can joy be mixed with difficulty? It's because of our unique Christian perspective on life that nothing just happens to us. Oh, please look at Romans chapter 5, verse 3. Please look at 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 and James chapter 1 verses 2 through 4 the uniquely Christian aspect of joy amidst problems is one of the glories of our witness to a lost and fallen world the, the, the little uh, section here closes out in a, in a thing about boasting we're not sure if it's boasting concerning Paul or boasting concerning Christ and the context seems to imply Paul but the syntax could mean Christ there are some tremendous truths here my friend but I think we need to realize that we need to take this ancient letter to the church at Philippi and realize that it is uniquely written to you. We need to accurately interpret it in its own day to understand Paul's message of this church. But once we know Paul's message, the truths are meant to be implemented in our daily lives. Friends, I don't know what you're going through, but I know this. God's going through it with you. I don't know the pain you bear, but I know this. There's a purpose in it. And there's a potential for joy in it that will have a greater impact on the witness of Christ and the honor of God. If you'll hang in there, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord, neither is your suffering. I've enjoyed being with you, and I'll see you again, same time, same place, next week. May the Lord bless you.